Good morning, Whitewater. Good to see most of you guys are awake. Uh, way to go. You made it to church. It's a sunny day. It's a sunny day and you're here. I'm so proud of you. I hope that God blesses you and uh, that you come out of here with a lot of sunshine in the heart, ready to enjoy the day. Uh, I just want to extend my, my invitation to uh, the Welcome to Whitewater Party. It's, we're really just going to build relationships. It's an awesome place if you're new and you want to meet other people who are new-ish and build relationships. That'd be great. If you've got a friend, you've been coming forever, but you've got a friend here, just bring them. Um, it'll be really fun, great food. And, uh, and we'll just talk a little bit together. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, if you're new, one of our, our great joys here is to help anyone and everyone move forward in their spiritual journey. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you are so much as where you are headed. So uh, that's our real goal here. Um, and, uh, you know, people take a journey at their own pace. And some of us, when we're heading into the summer, are going to be starting off the hiking season a little bit slower and more lethargic, and that's totally true and fine at Whitewater. Some of us are moving slower, some of us mid-range, and some of us are just like blasting through. You can move at any of those paces here at our church. Let me pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you would give us great joy today. Give us great encouragement today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I worked for a summer at a construction site, uh, a few sites. We were building homes. I was more like the cleaner, upper, gopher, and I was just learning. But my boss would go around with a hammer. He'd go around with a hammer, and you would hit the different framing of a house. So you laid the foundation, and then you begin laying the frame. You know, the two-by-fours and all the walls or the interiors of the walls. He'd go around hitting those things, making sure they were put together well. If they were like hodgepodge, they were kind of janky, they weren't put together well, he'd hit those things and just knock them down and say, hey, it needs to be reframed. Have you guys ever had to reframe something? And like the, the carpenters hated it when you do it, but he's like, we're not building something that's going to fall apart. It's going to be right. And so you need to reframe it. Sometimes they'd put the walls in the wrong spots. If they're in the wrong spot, say, reframe it. We need to knock it down and restart. And uh, so it was interesting to be a part of that, even though I was more of the gopher and never actually got to uh, do much of the framing. When, uh, this was a long time ago in the life of George, it was about a week ago. I've been, I was at a pastor's meeting and I was on the East Coast and my brain never got used to the uh, the three hour difference. And so it's been a long week, but I did a wedding in a brewery. This last week, it was it, it maybe it was a, it used to be a brewery. Now it's a tap room, but it was a brewery. Was it Rainier? Is that what it was? Oh, it was it was crazy. It was, whatever it is, it's 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 got a tap room now, and it was I've never been in an environment like that. My dad and uh, my grandpa are pastors, and I, I do not know what they would have thought of me if they saw me. I walked in, I was handed a beverage immediately, and everyone's just chill around here. It was just like, there are barrels of things, and everyone's smiling and happy. The, our band, the Whitewater band, was hired to be there, and they were just like, bah, bah, bah. it was going crazy, and my daughter was dancing, and it was so fun, and uh, I, I actually could share. It's uh, Max and Kat, if some of you guys know them, they're here, they just got married. <laughs> So excited for you guys. Congratulations. It was awesome. I'd never been at a wedding like this before. It was so cool. Um, you know, the, the, we had our, our Whitewater band. They weren't playing Whitewater songs. Like, they were just playing songs I'd never imagined them playing. Like, like, Aubrey was singing like Aretha Franklin stuff, and Michael was rapping. Um, it was insane. We had Sam was our sound guy there, and he was like kind of you know doing the sound on his iPad. And all of a sudden, you know, like he was getting into it. Sam, and he'd get back to his you know doing his sound, and he's been running sound today. It was just so fun. It was so fun, and there was a a moment where uh, everyone came together. It was a different wedding in this way too. Like it was in this big room. And uh, most weddings that I do, like everyone is watching the wedding. Like they're sitting where you're at and they're watching and the couple's up here. In this wedding, everyone 
was part of the wedding. Like everyone just kind of crowded around these barrels and candles and kind of just pressed them real close. It was like, hello, what's your name, you know? And all these people just, boom, were here. And it was such an intimate feel. It was very unique. And uh, there was this really powerful moment where it just like all of a sudden got really hushed. Really quiet in anticipation and joy and awe, like this really powerful thing was going to happen. Friends and family, people who, are, who don't know each other, but they know Max or Kat through different relationships that have been long relationships or short relationships, but there's, there's a spark of real meaning and love that's happened for them to be there. And uh, it was so incredible. All of a sudden, it just got quiet. And it was time for the vows. And I remember uh, having... Max and Kat repeat these words. Will you, Max, have this woman to be your wife, to live together in holy covenant of marriage? Will you love her and comfort her, honor her and keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, be faithful to her so long as you both shall live? So answer, I will. And Max was like, I will, which was good. And then I looked out at everybody else after we had the vows between them. I said, will you family and friends who are witnessing all these promises do all in your power to uphold these two persons in their marriage and if so answer we will and all of God's people said we will you guys don't have to but I would suggest really upholding them they're a great couple but it was so cool because the room was just like we will they just like screamed it like everyone was there in support of them and it was beautiful because there was this amazing relationship being forged like two metals coming together and being forged into something new a new alloy that's stronger than what it was with two separate pieces like the two were becoming one and it was incredible that, that this covenant the Bible calls it covenant relationship was happening the deepest of relationships and not only with the two that were in front of me and in between everybody, but there was this community covenant happening. Like everyone was committing and saying, we are going to be faithful. We are going to support you. We're here for you. We love you. We're committing to doing everything in our power to help you guys be successful in your relationship. And friends, it was a beautiful picture of what relationships should be all about. We're doing this series. It's all about relationships. And the reality is When we talk about relationships, we live in a world that struggles with relationships. Would you agree? We live in a world that paints a totally different vision than what I was just talking about to us. We live in a world that's like, why commit? It's afraid of commitment. Why would you fully commit like that? Why would you put yourself out like that? Why would you hedge yourself in like that? We live in a world where it's more focused on convenience and the vision... um, that I want to talk to you guys about a biblical vision of relationship, I have to start with some of the the tough news about our world. Did you know that almost 900,000 marriages have ended in divorce in America? That means about almost 50%. It's somewhere around 50% in America of the marriages that happen end in divorce or annulment. There are, uh, I learned this from someone who I think is here today a few years ago, that in Washington State, um, like our own backyard, that there are, are kids in need of foster care that number to about 11,000, give or take. This is a few years ago, that statistic, but 11,000 kids need homes consistently because of bad decisions or like some kind of crazy life event that happened or an addiction or... Um, negligence that have made it so that families are having to be split and kids put into someone else's home or a child put into someone else's home. We live in a world that struggles with relationship, do we not? I can give you statistic after statistic looking at these things, but we live in a world that struggles. I, um, you, I could give you those statistics, but it, it, it changes when you have a friend whose spouse said, I'm done with you, and I'm done with this. I can give you all the statistics in the world, but it becomes very real in our own lives and our own relationships when you have a a parent, a mom or a dad, a, a grandma or a grandmother, walk out the door and never come back in as a mom or dad again. Never come back as grandma or grandpa. They've severed the relationship. Something happens where what was... And what was great and what was needed and what was supportive and what was life-giving is gone 
because of selfishness or hurt or addiction. Something gets in there and blows it up. I'm old enough now where I'm seeing a lot of people my age or a little bit younger even who are married in their early 20s and mid-20s. Like all of a sudden some of those marriages like head, head to some rough waters hit the rocks. Some people even divorce, separate. Some people who even have kids separate and leave their kids. I've seen um, friends who have been best friends and life starts getting in and values are different and one begins heading in a different direction than the other. And one leaves the other in the dust. One of, the, one, of the, the part, one of the best friends is like all in, sacrifices everything, loves this person. And, and, and their friend who they've, like, they've had a deep relationship with, like they're not into it anymore or it's not working for them or life's taking them on a different journey. And so like, they just are willing to walk away from it like it's nothing. I think it's because we've bought into like this vision that the world gives of love and relationship. The world gives us this vision of like like relationships are all about convenience. Like if it's convenient, if it's good for you, then then continue the relationship. If if it's not, if it's inconvenient, if it's if it's uh, difficult, if it's hard, if it just if it's not fun anymore, just just get rid of it. Get something new. It's about consuming not committing. We have, so, like this world, we, we're all about consumption. We're all about uh, uh, making it easier on ourselves. Is it convenient? I have a friend who goes through, who goes through uh, cell phones like crazy. Every three to six months, you know, they got a new cell phone because, because they, uh, they like to have the newest update. And if the iPhone isn't working, they'll get the, uh, the Mitsubishi. And if that's not working, they'll get the Honda. If that's not working, they'll get whatever phone is out there, whatever the new thing is. And they just trade it, they just trade it, they just trade it. They get, you know, the, the, the new edition, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And some of us are going through our friendships and our family as if they're like cell phones that aren't convenient anymore. And so we just throw them away and get something new. And I wanted to be really real with you as a church today and just say, this is the world we live in, is it not? Now, what if that vision that the world has given us, what if God's vision of relationship is so different that we, we don't even realize how much we, as Christians or people who hang out around church or who are exploring faith, maybe you don't even know the Lord yet, but you're here. Maybe we are so like drenched in the world's vision of relationship that we don't even realize that we're not following God's vision for it. That we don't even realize that we've bought into this foolishness, like craziness. Is that possible? See, God's vision is an incredible vision for relationships. Unbelievable. And I want to ask the question, what if some of us need to knock down the walls and reframe what relationships are around God's blueprint and build some walls that last and knock down the junk that's jangy and it's uncommitted and it's, con- it's all about convenience and step into what God's vision is for a relationship. So let's talk about that today. God, when, he's, when he established relationship at the very beginning, it's, it's what we know biblically is called covenant. I mentioned it earlier in that story about the wedding, that when they came together, they were coming together in this covenant relationship, a promise before God and before others. It's this depth of relationship that's different than just like a, um, than you know, today's uh, world where you just swipe to find who you want. It's different than the world we live in where it's just like about convenience, about what you want. And if this person doesn't please you, if, it, if they don't meet their end of the bargain, you just, you peace out, you cut them loose and you move to something new. It's totally different than that. God's covenant love is a faithful and loyal love. In fact, in Psalms 117, it uses the language that we see all through the scripture, these two particular words and these two particular concepts that really capture covenant. Whenever you hear these words in scripture, it's talking about covenant love. Covenant is a committed relationship characterized by faithful 
love, excuse me, faithful and loyal love. Covenant is a committed relationship characterized by faithful and loyal love. Psalm 117 says this, praise the Lord, all the nations glorify him, all peoples for his faithful love to us is great. The Lord is, his faithfulness endures forever. So in, in verse one, it says, praise God. Who's supposed to praise him? All peoples. You have to be Christian or not? Do you have to be a follower of Jesus or not? No, like just get in line with learning to praise God because the creator who created everything is good and here's why he's good. Here's why you should praise him. Regardless of your background, regardless of your, your faith and philosophies, here's why you should learn to praise the Lord. It says, in verse in verse two for his faithful love to us is great to the world the lord's faithfulness endures forever the two words are in this a faithful love the word for that in hebrew is chesed beautiful word right in english chesed sounds like you're hawking something up to win a contest to spit sorry if i spray on anybody out here chesed can you say it with me chesed some of you were like, eh, sad. <laughs> that was really funny from up here. That was really eh, sad. Eh, sad. It means faithful love. It's, it means it's the kind of love that shows kindness, like true kindness, compassion, like where you feel it. It's not fake. It's not inauthentic. There's, there's a realness to it where you, it's felt and acted upon. It's kindness, compassion, Faithful love. And then in the, in the second half of verse two, the Lord's faithfulness endures forever. The word for faithfulness there is emet. And it means faithfulness, truth. Faithfulness and, faithfulness and truth. Like when you put those together, it becomes like an alloy, like two metals that come together. And what it's talking about is covenant love. God's covenant and covenants in the Bible weren't always just between God and people and his promises that he always is faithful to, that he's always loyal to. Um, it also is between fathers and sons, mothers and daughters and communities where there's a, a faithful, loyal, like never going to quit, never going to stop love and committedness to each other. It's, uh, in the world we live in, it's like this is so foreign. Why do you have to communicate? Why do you even need to get married? It's just a piece of paper. There's all these reasons that we have to not commit. Well, I'm, ma- I'm mainly committed. No, you're keeping the back door open. We live in a back door culture, don't we? Now, uh, let me give you an example of this covenant uh, that could happen in, between different types of people, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, people. Genesis 47 says this in verse 29. When the time approached for him to die, uh, Jacob called his son Joseph uh, to him and he said this, if I have found favor with you, put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you will deal with me in kindness, chesed, and faithfulness, emet. Do not bury me in Egypt. He wanted to be buried with his forefathers. And one of the po- points you might notice about this is the covenant love, but also the strange point where he has to like grab him under the thigh. Did any of you notice that? <laughs> It's, it's, how Chris, it's how Whitewater, that's how we make promises to each other. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I walked up to a guy, his name's Mark. He's just like really tall, good, good guy. And, uh, you know, he's been here for a number of months. And I, I went up to him and I, I crouched just a little bit. And I grabbed him right just above the knee, not too high up here because it wasn't, I didn't want to, uh, you know, make that big of a promise to him. So I grabbed him right <laughs> here, right in the thigh. And uh, he just went rigid. He <laughs> looked at me, he's like, what are you doing? I was like, Dude, I'm 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 starting a covenant with you. Don't you, don't you read your Bible? Some of the guys are like, no, don't do that. We need to focus in on the sermon. Uh, they'd have funny things uh, to make promises back then, apparently. But the the chesed and emet, the faithful, loyal covenant, is at the heart of it. Other thing to know about the covenant, I'll make this point really quickly, but I think it's it's important, is that in, in any covenant, there's this. There, there is a committedness to helping the weaker party. There's an obligation to help the weaker party. And when we are in a relation, relationship, a covenant, uh, a covenant relationship with God, where there's faithfulness, loyalty, and trust, who's the weaker partner between us and God? It's us, right? We fail. We don't always live up to our end of the deal. But God's covenants were always built so that he was obligated to helping us, the weaker party. 
We live in a world that says it's social Darwinism, friends. Like it's the strong eat the weak. It's the strong eat the weak in school. It's the strong eat the weak in business. It's the strong eat the weak politically and, um, and, and militarily even. Like peop- we have this, this idea that it's the strong eat the weak. But God's covenant love, the vision God has is totally different than that. His vision for love is that the strong serve and help the weak. The strong one in the relationship is faithful. It's, how could you call yourself a friend if there's no skin in the game? How can you save a faithful, loyal love when that faithfulness and loyalty is tested by the disloyalty or disappointment of a weaker party making a bad decision or headed in a bad direction or not really fulfilling what you had agreed upon? How is it at all faithful and loyal if you check out and, and cut bait? How can we be a people of God that show a world a different vision of loyalty and faithfulness if we buy into the strong, eat the weak? Friends, that's not what we're called to. We are called to a covenant, love. Some of you guys might ask, well, where do you draw the line? Like, you know, where it's too far when someone's really betrayed or they become so toxic. How many of you guys have had toxic people in your life that it's like, it's, it is damaging my kids, my family, myself. I want to be really clear, like, if you know the story of, uh, of the Bible, there's a story Jesus told about the prodigal son where this younger son runs off and the father gives him his inheritance and the son says, I want what you can give me, but I don't want a relationship with you and runs away. And that story is, the, is Israel's story, God's people's story. That's, that's the, if anybody was listening to that, they would have been like, oh yeah, that's, that's what our people did. We wanted the good stuff God could give us, and then we ran away from him. We didn't want a right relationship with him. We were that younger, that younger son. And Jesus tells a story to say that, that the father, even though he lets the son go, and he lets him go and, and mess his life and do all this dumb stuff, and he has to let him, because he can't force him or it's not really love, he lets him go, but he's always looking for him because he has this has said and met this faithful, loyal love that won't quit on him. It won't stop. And he, he always is looking with compassion toward those who have run off. Now, how does that apply to us? Like some of us maybe have new marriages and exes who have gotten remarried. It's not saying like that you should hold out hope or dump the person you're with to be biblical to get back with the other person if they ever came back around and the addiction stopped and the crazy cycle and all. No, what this is saying is that we should have a longing to restore our brothers and sisters, our exes. We, we should, we, even though they can be a mess and toxic, that God changed our heart to be like his heart to want their best. And even if it can never be repaired to what it was fully because you're remarried or you've had to move on, and maybe they're still too toxic, you should long for them to be restored. And if they can be restored, even if maybe it's not healthy for you to be spending a lot of time with them, there needs to be a desire and prayer for them to become what they should have been. Are you with me? I think that's really important to say. So I'm not saying you need to stay in abusive, toxic relationships. You need to get safe and, and get out if that's what you're in right now. And, they're, and if he's hitting you or there's a major addiction that's just taking over and it's damaging your kids, like you need to really look at what's going on in your life, get help. But we're to remain faithful, loyal, covenant people. So what does God's faith what does his faithfulness and loyalty look like? The best description, the best picture of God's love is in his son, Jesus. And so I just want to tell a real brief story from that so we can get clear on what God's love in action looks like, what his covenant in action looks like. And uh, this is in your notes. This is in, uh, point number two. It's when we are unfaithful, God is faithful. When we are unfaithful, God is faithful. Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, like the, the one who was always jumping in the water first, the one who was always taking the first step, embarrassing himself, but he was always bold and courageous. How many of you guys relate to Peter? Any of you guys relate to him? He's just like that guy. Just go, some of you guys are like embarrassed. I, I'm kind of like him. Peter just would go for it. And uh, there's this point where in the, in the narrative of Jesus, he's headed toward the cross. He's headed toward, toward dying for the sins of the world. And um, Jesus says, you're going to betray me. 
You're going to betray me three times. And Peter goes, I, Lord, I never will betray you. I never will leave you. You know, he's like saying, we've got this covenant. Like, I, anybody else, everybody else will fall away. I never will. Well, then Jesus all of a sudden gets arrested. And then he gets taken onto this ridiculous uh, trial. And it's this, really this mistrial of justice. And it's terrible. And while he's in this trial and getting beat and getting interrogated and, and he's on his way to being sent to the cross by the religious leaders, um, Peter follows like the action a little bit. So he gets in this courtyard and then someone says, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? And he goes, me? Nope, not me. They're like, no, 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 I think I've seen you with him. You know, you're from Galilee, right? You're from, you're from the north with him. And he's like, no, I, I'm not. I'm not with Jesus. I, I, I don't have anything to do with him. And they say it a third time. They're like, well, we can tell by your accent. You are one of his disciples. You're with him. And he goes, I swear it. And he, likes, he, he goes off swearing about how he is not connected to nor in support of Jesus. He betrays him three times. Jesus gets put on the cross, dies for the sins of the world, and all his followers leave him and abandon him. And the guy who said he'd never leave him, the guy who said, I am faithful, I am loyal, this is covenant, like, there, there's not, there doesn't get any better than this, Jesus. And that guy betrayed him. Have you ever had someone betray you? Have you ever had someone just completely let you down? Like, cut bait. When you needed them most, when your need was the greatest, I mean, they were... You were depending on them and they left. A parent, a mom or a dad, a husband or a wife, a friend. And you're like, I thought this relationship was solid. Like, how did that make you feel? What happened as a result? I think a lot of us, we've stopped trusting. We've been emotionally blown up. And so we don't even get into relationships or let people get close to us because we just don't trust them. We don't want to go through that pain again. How many people here... Maybe, maybe you let someone down. Maybe you were unfaithful. You betrayed them in their moment of need when they were depending on you. You bailed. And that feeling of shame is exactly what we see with Peter. When Jesus is on the, he's on the, the edge of the lake up in Galilee, and he's been raised back to the dead, and, his, and Peter's gone back out to fishing because he's like, I was supposed to be a fisher of men, but I failed, and I betrayed my Lord and Savior. And he's like, God can't use me. And so he goes out to fish, and his friends, his disciples go with him. And then they, they don't catch anything, and then they, they see this figure on the edge of the, of the water and calls out to him and says, hey, throw your, your nets on the other side. So they do, and when they pull them up, what do they have? They have so much fish, they can't even like contain it. It's like ridiculous. And it reminds them of the moment Jesus did that earlier in their relationship with him. And all of a sudden, Peter recognizes that's Jesus. And he jumps in the water because he's Peter. <laughs> and starts swimming to him as the guys stay in the boat and pass him as they go to the shore. <laughs> and Jesus says, hey, I, come and eat with me. And Jesus would always eat with him. So it was like the sacred thing. And you guys have that, like there's something wonderful and sacred about like breaking bread together with your family and your deepest friends. It's laughter and joking. But I bet it was a little bit quieter at this, at this um, breakfast. Because as excited as they are about Jesus being there, there's also the, this great shame for having left him and betrayed him. And none greater than Peter, who is the one who said, I never will leave you. And three times he betrayed Jesus. And we pick up, in verse uh, 15, John 21, it says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he says, obey me and lead people, serve people. Verse 17, he asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked the third time. Why was he grieved? Because he had denied him three times. Jesus is, is bringing it back up. He's saying, you denied me three times. Jesus isn't afraid to speak truth to his friend. And Peter was grieved, and he said, uh, even when he asked him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know everything, and you know that, that I love you. And what's going on here 
is Jesus is giving him a chance to, to re-covenant with him. He's saying, you were unfaithful, you were disloyal, three times. But I want, you, I want to be friends with you. I want us to be right. I'm, I'm forgiving you. I am restoring you. See, the, the faithfulness and loyalty of God restores our unfaithfulness and our disloyalty and our dysfunction and our, our wickedness and our foolishness and our terrible decisions and the hurts and the hang-ups that we have in our life around our relationships. And Jesus is saying, like, this is chesed, this is emet, this is faithfulness in action. How many of you guys have ever received forgiveness for bailing and letting someone down? Come on now. What was that like? Isn't that so freeing? It's like it changes everything when someone is willing to restore you when you know you don't deserve it. I think this is such a beautiful picture. Peter is in our predicament. He fails. He's unfaithful. And so much of the time we are unfaithful. But when we are unfaithful, God is what? Faithful. He's faithful. And I want to remind you of that today. Psalm 117 again says this. Praise the Lord, all the nations. Glorify him. Take joy in your hearts. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. This isn't to praise us. It's not to praise other people. This is to praise God because all of us fail at some point in our relationships. And I want to remind you today, and I want to remind myself with the truth of God's love. His love, some of us need to hear this today, is faithful. Some of you feel like, oh, I've been too messed up. I've made too many bad decisions, or I don't even belong in a church to be here right now. God's love is faithful. His love never leaves us. It never abandons us. His love is unfailing. His love is loyal. His love is true. His love is immeasurable, unstoppable. His love is reckless. To those who don't understand God, it looks reckless. Why would you receive the sinner? Why would you take the son who's run away back? Why would you take Peter back and put him up as a leader after he's failed again and again? It's because he's faithful. It's because he's loyal to you and me. Like our lives, your life right now, in your situations, like not tomorrow, not from your past, like now, who you are. God's kind of love is relentless. It restores us. God's love saves us. It, it's unending and it heals us. And God's love is covenant. That's the vision. That's the heart of God throughout the whole scriptures. God's love is covenant. And Jesus was sent to fulfill the covenants that we all broke. God made covenant after covenant after covenant. You know, uh, uh, the Adam and Eve broke it. Uh, Abraham broke it. Um, Moses and the people of God broke it. You know, you just go through over and over and over, and they never uh, fulfill their, their end of the deal. But God is faithful in Christ. Luke 22 teaches us this. It says in 19, and he took bread, gave thanks. This is Jesus. He broke it and gave it to them and said this, this is my body which is given for you. It costs to be faithful. It costs us time and energy and life to be loyal and we live in a world where it's like i don't need to be patient i don't need to be like put skin in the game i don't like i can just cut this off this is so much easy it'll be so much easier and we think of the ease rather than the joy of seeing someone restored and become who they fully were designed to be because we're impatient, because we're unloving, because we're unfaithful, because we're, we're disloyal. And, it, and Jesus says, this is my body, which is given for you because of your unfaithfulness. Do this in rem- remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup with wine in it is the new covenant. It's the new covenant that I'm making with you. I'm taking all your bad so you can have all my good. And this is the new covenant covenant in my blood, which I pour out for you. God is faithful to the point of giving his life for us. That means we become a covenant people who have accepted the love and grace of God when we decide to trust him and covenant with him, love him. In a little bit, we're going to be taking communion together to remind ourselves that we're part of this community. The last piece is this. Our relationship with God reveals our relationships with other people. Our relationship with God reveals our relationships 
with people. What you believe about God shows up in how you treat other people. If you believe God's a God of convenience, you just pull him in when you need him, and to get him like, like a vending machine, what you want when you need it, and you treat him like that, I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably treat other people like that. How you view God and how you have a relationship with God it often indicates how you treat and have a relationship with others. And friends, what does your relationship with God say about your relationship with people? And what does your relationship with people say about your relationship with God? Do you love and do you trust? Are you learning to be faithful? Are you learning to be loyal or do you give up? Are you impatient? Do you have higher standards for other people than you have for yourself? Are you unfair? Do you run away when you should actually stand in place and fight for something that matters? Or are you willing to walk out on your kids? Are you willing to walk out on your wife? Willing to walk out on your husband for foolishness? Something that doesn't last. When you have a God who created you, saw you fail, gave his son to die for your failures so that you could have life and experience the faithfulness of God. Proverbs 3, 3 says this. If we know God, it inspires this. Let love and faithfulness, covenant love, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Let love and faithfulness define who you are. People looked at your life. Are you defined by covenant faithfulness and loyal love. If you'd bow your heads just for a moment, I want to ask you a few questions. As we close here today, let me ask you this. I want you to think, this is for you. It's not for your family member. It's not for the person next to you. You yourself. Is there anyone here who has been really wounded, abandoned, or feels like, man, I've been betrayed by some of my closest relationships? And that wound is still there and it's hard to trust. And you've been emotionally blown up. If that's you, would you just put your hand up so I can see it? If you've gone through that, put your hand up. Yeah, I see you. I see you. Go ahead and put that down. May you experience God's loyal, faithful love that heals that wound so you can trust again. Now, if you're here and maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've had a pattern of unfaithfulness in your life. If you've had a pattern where you've let people down, you've been unfaithful, and maybe you've you've worked through this, maybe you haven't, but if that's this has been part of your life, part of your story, and maybe there's shame, and maybe there's guilt, and maybe there's regret that just haunts you because of would you put your hand up for a moment? Thank you. Go ahead and put that down. May you experience the faithful love of God in Christ Jesus, whose sacrifice on the cross, whose blood that was poured out for you, whose body that was broken for you, give you forgiveness and break you free to learn to be faithful, to learn to be loyal, and to walk in freedom. Friends, I love you. Let me pray a prayer blessing over your life. Heavenly Father, we just um, we thank you for your love. I just ask that those of us that have a hard time receiving love, those of us who have been burnt and abandoned and betrayed, Lord, that we receive your love today, Lord, your faithfulness, not any other, Lord, your love, and would that transform us in how we love others. Lord, if there's people here that have, have experienced terrible decisions and patterns in their life that have that have led to betrayal, to abandon, abandoning their, their friends, the ones that they said that they would be there for and they weren't, Lord. Would you flood them with forgiveness, Lord? If they need to make a phone call, if they need to go talk with someone, if they need to, if they need to make it right even today, Lord, would you give them the power and strength to make the call, to go have the conversation, to buy the cup of coffee and fix that? Lord, and begin walking a new path, a new pattern of faithfulness and loyalty after your own heart. Lord, may we be a covenant people that love you and love others and give us a big vision, Lord, of your love, not the world's convenient consumeristic love. Help us to knock down any walls and reframe them with your love, Heavenly Father. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
As we sing this next song, I want to just remind you that the welcome to, welcome to Whitewater and then Journey class could be a first step maybe for you if you're newer here in joining a community of committedness and covenant, faithfulness and loyalty. Let's worship.